So thank you for joining us this afternoon. Uh, we're going to get started here with a, another special recognition uh, award winner. So you're seeing your second known winner of the day. Uh, so we can offer congratulations. Uh, a, a very uh, interesting and exciting and compelling project. Uh, that's probably why it won. Uh, and, uh, that, that is also here in the Netherlands. So it uh, has a, a local connection as well with, with uh, wind energy. So I'll let our speaker present it. And Michael, if you want to come up and we can get started. Thank you. Thank you and uh, good afternoon. Of course, I'm very delighted to be here and uh, honored to uh, have already received the prize before I have given my story. Um, but I will give the story anyway. And I just realized that uh, I've been living in Amsterdam for 12 years, some, some time ago, but I've never been in this building. So that's, uh, that's also a very nice uh, first for me to uh, be presenting in this, uh, this building. Um, before uh, sort of jumping into the, uh, the, the presentation, I basically have a question for you, is whether you have any idea which source of electricity generation um, in what sort of electricity generation was the most new capacity invested uh, last year, in 2011? Gas. Gas. Do I have others for gas? Do I have nuclear? Solar? Solar, maybe? Wind? Gas? Gas. All right. And the winner is solar. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, we were we were in the right direction, right? It was not nuclear, that's clear. Coal was not also on the on the in the top five, but actually it's solar, gas, and wind, which is the top three in terms of new capacity investments in 2011. Um, and of course, some of the sort of more traditional ways of uh, producing electricity actually decomm decommissioned more than they installed new capacity. If we break down it a little bit further, you can see clearly that uh, this, this, this solar, gas, and wind really is the majority of new capacity. And actually, renewables is almost 70% of all the new capacity installed last year. So this is becoming a significant industry. Just some more figures to, uh, to give you an appreciation of how big of an industry this renewable power currently is. Uh, this shows you the, uh, the total new investments on an annual basis in renewables, uh, starting well in this graph from, from 54 billion in 2004 to more than 260 billion uh, last year. And that's actually relatively equally spread throughout the world. It's not only in Europe, it's not only in North America, it's also in China, and it's certainly also in South America and Africa. And actually this year, uh, Renew the, the investments in renewable energy exceeded the ones in fossil. Right? So this is the first year where the total amount of investments in this particular uh, brand of energies uh, exceeded those in the fossil fuels. And that trend is likely to continue. Um, if you look at the forecasts for the next couple of years and certainly up to the year 2020, there will be significant investments in renewable power. Um, so this industry is rapidly growing in terms of uh, in terms of investments but also in terms of operation there's just more and more capacity to operate and maintain oops now the story you uh, hear often is uh, yeah it's all very nice and, 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 and fine with the renewable power but they basically thrive on subsidies we cannot afford to continue this trend because it's just too expensive, and it's only because governments pay for it. Well, actually, this is a um, what, you show, what is shown here is the cost of energy broken down for the different types of generation uh, sources. And if you take into account all subsidies and all taxation uh, incentives that are being used in the industry, onshore wind is already at par with some of the fossil uh, fuel energies. And offshore wind is probably going in that same direction, but it really requires a further cost reduction. 
So if you compare the sources on an, on an, sort of an equal and fair playing field, uh, wind energy is in the same ballpark as, uh, as coal. Gas currently is certainly still cheaper. But of course, for the fossil fuels, if you look into the future, um, the chances of those costs going down is not very likely. Whereas in terms of the renewable power industry, as we've, we are seeing in the solar industry, costs are reduced very significantly over the years um, in, these, uh, in these generations. Okay, let's focus a little bit more on wind because that's uh, the main part of this, uh, this story. If we look at the, uh, the total installed wind capacity globally, we are now almost at 250 gigawatts um, with a sharp upward trend. And also that trend is, uh, is likely to continue depending a little bit on which scenario you take. But in all scenarios, uh, the, the, the amount of installed capacity in wind will increase uh, rapidly um, well beyond 2020. Um, at the same time, we see innovations in, in the turbines themselves. Uh, whereas a couple of years ago, people said, well, 90 meter rotor, that's about the limit because otherwise the loads become too heavy and it's going to be too expensive to build the tower. Recently, the first prototype uh, machine was built in France with a 160 meter rotor. That is significant. I don't know exactly what the hub height is. It's probably 140 meters above the ground. Those are really huge machines. And the 10 megawatt machine, which will have a rotor diameter near 200 meters, is already on the drawing board. Right, so this, this trend will continue. And interestingly, that, that has two consequences. Of course, this, become, this is, in terms of cost, is a cost reduction because the, 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 uh, the, both the investment but also the operational cost per megawatt goes down. Uh, but also, it suddenly opens up uh, the field for more inland turbines. So turbines in places where the wind is not blowing as hard there a large rotor diameter really helps to produce, still produce kilowatt hours in an efficient way. So also this will also push the onshore development very much. And please keep in mind that although offshore is one of the focus areas of my presentation, onshore is still the fastest growing part of wind energy business. Um, well, to sort of wrap up this, uh, this whole explosion of costs and investments and Operational expenses, this uh, shows you something also with the, with the split between offshore and onshore. This is more focused on, uh, on Europe, uh, where, of course, the, the offshore is more important because there's more space offshore, and Europe is uh, rather crowded, uh, especially in this part of Europe. So that's why our focus is on the, onshore, the offshore um, developments. Now, ECOFIS is a um, consultancy company working in renewable energies over the whole scope, working from energy efficiency to climate policies to sustainable transport, uh, but also supporting project developers and project owners in developing uh, sustainable energy um, uh, power plants, basically. Uh, so wind farms and solar and bio. Um, and since we're so close to the North Sea, uh, we're actually below the North Sea currently, um, not to make you scary or something, but <laughs> please, re please be reminded that this will be flooded completely. <laughs> um, I don't know how, first floor, second, third, well, anyway. <laughs> um, since we're so close, the North Sea is relatively ideal, actually, for offshore wind. The wind resource is very good, wind speeds are good. Accessibility to ports is very good. Experience in terms of installation and marine expertise is very high. And the, the, um, the depth of the, the water is rel it's relatively shallow. It's about 20 meters at, ma at max throughout the whole North Sea platform. So that's why you see such a lot of activity in the North Sea area in terms of offshore wind. And we've been involved right from the start, basically. We're still involved with right from the start from project development all the way up to operational performance management and assessment of operational wind farms. 
Okay, just to uh, have you bring you a little bit up to speed of what offshore wind is about and what does it look like, um, please be, this is a power plant, right? This is 300 megawatts out in the ocean, uh, out in the sea, I would say, out in, um, producing electricity for about 300,000 households. Um, but you also see what, what is sort of specific about this power plant compared to a coal power plant. These are individual installations in a harsh environment. So consider doing O&M on these, on these turbines. You have to visit every one of them. So you better get your O&M in order because otherwise cost will explode. And so O&M is even more critical than, ha than just being able to visit one site and do all your O&M work there. Here you have to visit 100 sites within a very limited weather window. Um, building those farms requires uh, special ships. It's very much a sequential business, piling one foundation after the other, installing one turbine after the other, placing the nacelle on top, or placing the rotor on top, getting the grid in order. Um, so it's a, it's a, it's it's a relatively long period of time that, that is required, but it all has to be done very efficiently within the weather windows and within the piling season, as we call it in North Sea, because you're not allowed to drill in certain um, times of the season because of the animals and fishes and birds, whatever. Yeah. This is just a movie, just also to give you an impression of what this offshore insulation means. Um, these are really large structures uh, with a lot of interfaces uh, between the foundation, the electrical part, the turbines, um, which all have to be managed in a very uh, strict and orderly fashion to, make, to be able to, to get them down securely and stay within the permit uh, regulations, stay within the health and safety limits that are required. Um, and I, I, I don't know if you have seen one of those blades on the ground it, it really is very impressive to, uh, to watch. Okay, well, just uh, sort of wrapping up this discussion is, is okay, what, what are we talking about? Um, for 300 wind farms, you have about 60 turbines, uh, so it's 60 monopiles, uh, rotor blades, it is 100 kilometer of electrical grid, it's a lifting of uh, 500 tons at least, and as usual in these big projects, there's hundreds of stakeholders to consider and to please somehow. Um, just to emphasize, this is another movie which, uh, which somehow movies, ah, well, we've skipped the movie. Forget about that one. We go to this one. We go to the risk part. Uh, because that's related actually to the movie, which you then didn't see, <laughs> which is actually access to a turbine. Access to a turbine and rough sea that go, go with these boats, and these boats, of course, do this. And you try to get on that ladder while the boat is doing this, and then there's a certain wave height that you're not allowed to do this, so you have a miss, and they go back to the port. They lose a day, it costs you a couple of thousand of euros, and they try it again next day. You also can try to do it with a helicopter, while well, you probably have an idea of the cost involved there. So, yes, this is very important to, to get those plannings accurate and to be able to have the right media data available to access the turbines when they are accessible. Uh, there's also all kinds of other risks involved, just to show two of them. This rarely, but it does happen. This also rarely, but it does happen. Okay, so what is required? What, what, what we have here is a, a mature but very young industry. The size and the magnitude of the project is, ex is really mature. The turbines are proven. The, the foundations are true, proven. The electrical grid is proven. The interfaces are still difficult to handle. But it is a mature industry, but it's also very young. It's not an industry that can sort of work on a hundred years of history and slowly have gathered all their things in, in, in practice. And that's also what we see in practice in advising these, these parties, is that they, they really need to learn from the traditional sort of marine environment. You have the utilities that are used to building coal power plants and now try to build a wind farm. Of course, they can use some of that methodology, but it is really a different challenge. 
And you have the new players, which have to figure out, okay, how to do this and how to operate this in a, in a good way. So there's still quite a, uh, there's quite a bit of room for improvement, um, which all has to do with data management, information management, and that's, of course, why we're here. That is where Ecofis and Bentley sort of jointly saw the need for a better management of the data uh, to, to, to minimize risk, to reduce costs, to increase efficiency, <clears throat> and to be able to monitor the performance of these wind farms over time in a very strict way and, and, and produce procedures based on that. So what we did is we started out with a pilot project, um, which was focused at test site Lelystad, which is a, uh, a test site. You can start the movie in, in the meantime if you well, may. Um, which is a test site for prototype wind turbines, which we coordinate. So we now have no signal. <laughs> um, and that's where we started to implement basically the, the, the features of AssetWise to, to show what this could mean for a relatively small wind farm, but which captures all the features of these big wind farms. We start out with a visual geospatial map of the, of the site because that, that is the real interface, which is good for us as a user, but also very good for the, for the stakeholder to understand where we are. And then you can sort of click on and click off the different assets within that, uh, that area of interest. And then you can figure out the information for every of those assets by zooming into that. And for these sites, for us, it's extremely important to get all the, all the regulation, regulatory uh, framework correct to have the right access procedures, right admission procedures, and make sure that our subcontractors have the right qualifications to enter the site. And that's actually what this system currently does for us, to make sure that we have a correct workflow to understand and to, ha to capture all the information, in this case for method statement for how do we do the works on the ground, <coughs> to, be, to have that in an orderly fashion. And this We've seen the experience, we have seen examples also from, from the, the way that people manage the, the offshore construction. This type of system really will help them uh, in, in creating efficiency in those processes. So that's of course also all accessible, the more the detailed, uh, detailed engineering work um, related to the contracts, related to the actual status of the construction. And uh, that is what, what this system allows you to do. Uh, maybe we can move on to the next. All right. We did a rough estimate. Okay, what, what, what impact does a asset-wise for, for renewable power uh, have on saving of cost in terms of investment and in terms of uh, operational expenditure? Of course, that's rather difficult to do at this point in time. But this is, I, th I still believe this is a conservative estimate. Um, and I think most importantly is what, what's at the bottom. It would reduce the cost of energy by a couple of percent. And that is significant. That is significant to be able, just by, by working more efficiently and having the data more accessible, to uh, reduce those costs. Now what is next? And I think this is the real interesting part. The real interesting part is uh, what I found in, um, at a, um, a meeting last week where we discuss, were discussing with a client of a wind farm they had which was underperforming by more than 20% of their expectation. I was doing this for, already for a couple of years. And, the, and more than 20% uh, loss in production is an equivalent of half a million per year. So it, that is a significant amount of money. They asked us to look into this. Okay, why is it underperforming? So please give us some data so we can try to analyze what's going on. And that is what was happening. Let's see if this one. Ah, that is what was happening, right? So yeah, they dug up some data, uh, monthly data of this, second data of that, uh, another Excel sheet with a different period in time. Um, and we were asking, do you also have map mass data, so data of the wind measurements? Uh, sorry, we, we don't have them. Sorry. Okay, so we did what we could do. We had a meeting with them. And then literally at the table, they said, well, there, there must be a CD somewhere. 
with this MadMass data on it. Okay, well, they dug it up. Actually, the CD, someone was actually at the meeting going over the different drives. We found another 10 Excel sheets, so we're now trying to figure that one out. Tells you the, the bigger story, right? The, this client, and they are not unique. They don't have the data at hand. So it takes a lot of time, but also it takes a lot of time to figure out, okay, what is this underperformance about? And once we found that out, it is questionable whether we can make a case against the manufacturer because we don't have the proof, right? We don't have the data. We don't have orderly data over years to, to substantiate that case. And that is where the new uh, Avara acquisition of Bentley comes into the picture because that, I think, is really very interesting for the wind, wind energy business is to have a very orderly way of collecting all this data, organizing all this data, and translating that into work procedures in terms of O&M, in terms of preventive O&M, um, to, to have trigger markers on different type of sensors, to have <coughs> uh, to relate that to the contracts, to do, relate that to bonus malus um, conditions within contracts, um, to get out of the mode of corrective maintenance and get into preventive maintenance, to get into reliability-centered maintenance. I think that is, that is really going to help the industry and really further going to decrease costs but also increase performance. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you. We can probably squeeze a few questions in if anyone has one. Don't be bashful. <laughs> Hi, it's, it's Remco Tucken, GIS Magazine in Holland. Um, uh, uh, what's the influence of uh, nationwide national politics in success or non-success of wind energy? Our good neighbors in Germany seem to be way ahead of us. Yeah. <laughs> they not only seem to be, but they really are. Um, I think the the influence of politics is if you if you sort of confine into the to the Dutch situation, but in general, I think in general, and that's not only true for the wind energy, but it's true for any industry. A consistent policy where where developers and investors know what they're going to expect in a couple of years or even ten years' lifetime is essential to to be able to develop and to take risks. Now, that is lacking in Holland so far. We, we have a horizon of a couple of months, maybe a year. Um, so that, that really um, holds back investors to continue this. I, I don't think it's cost. I don't think it's subsidies. I don't think it's finance. I think it's purely it's the framework of being able to develop with a uh, well-defined risk profile to start with. And now the risk profile is not well defined. Is the um, the asset life of a wind turbine similar? I mean, can you compare it to other forms of power generation, or has it got a shorter lifespan to it? Um, currently, they they're looking at thirty years of of operational lifetime. So it's probably a little bit shorter than nuclear, but it's it's a significant amount, and and that's. Uh, as far as I understood, uh, they take it as a conservative estimate. It's not because of the foundation. It's not the electrical grid. It's probably the turbine itself, which can be repowered. So uh, I know that the grid and the foundation, I think they are designed for 50 years' lifetime. One more? So, so I'll ask one. So the, you're, you give a very conservative estimate for the cost savings or the, the, the ROI, if you will, on the project. Is that something that you're paying attention to and, and looking as you move to new, uh, new consulting engagements or new projects, uh, building building a, a, a more accurate and maybe less conservative estimate of that? And, and is that driving any decisions in in the future work? I think it's it's more driving the the way of developing. I mean, if uh, I think what we need to do in the, to start with is to work together with owners, with operators, to help them appreciate the benefits and the efficiency measures that, that will, will come out of such a project. 
instead of sort of put a full-blown solution on the table and say, well, you have to pay quite a bit, but it will save you in the end. I think that that is not going to work at present. Uh, so I think we need to work together with them and show case by case that really this added value is there. And, uh, and we are sort of helped by practice. I mean, there's another example where uh, parties need to renegotiate an O&M contract. Right? Five years warranty is about to expire, so we need to renegotiate. Um, and there's a lot of money at stake there. It's, it's about 40 million of, of investment decision, basically, that has to be taken. If you don't have your numbers right, you don't know what you're up against. Right? So there, a significant investment in being able to have the data available of those five years past operation is essential to be, be able to, to negotiate a good contract for the next couple of years. Very good. Well, thank you very much. And congratulations again. Thank you.